Hello, everybody. This is Paul Neeson with Torah Life Ministries. We're here interviewing today Joanne Smith. And uh, Joanne, uh, say hello to the Torah Life audience. Hello. <laughs> Joanne, thank you so much for being a guest on the, on the show. It's so wonderful to have you. Uh, Joanne, uh, give us a little bit of your background. Uh, did you grow up a believer, and where did you grow up? Um, I did not grow up a believer. I grew up atheist. Um, my dad raised me, and I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. And I had some exposure to different denominations and everything, but stayed an atheist most of my, um, all of my childhood, teenage years, and most of my 20s. So when was it that you uh, decided that you're no longer going to be an atheist and you're going to believe in something? How old were you when that happened? <laughs> well, I started homeschooling my children, and um, my oldest was eight at the time. So let's see. That was about 12 years ago, and he, you know, when, with homeschooling comes a lot of exposure to professing Christians, and uh, he was exposed to a lot of um, talk about the Bible and prayer and everything, and he wanted to understand it, so one day he asked if we could go to church, and um, I was just the kind of parent that I thought, well, if it's not going to kill you, then why not? Let's give it a try, so if he would have wanted to go to uh Hindu temple or Muslim mosque or whatever, I would have went, but as it were, he wanted to go to a Christian church, so I asked him to pick which one, and that's what started it. Wonderful, wonderful. So so what happened? You were at the church, and what happened then? Well, we started at a contemporary Christian church with, um, you know, the kind with loud rock music and skits and all that kind of stuff, and I didn't open the Bible. I didn't have any interest in it. I just really was interested in... Um, presenting myself as a good person to the world. I was still drinking and doing drugs at the time and smoking and all of that. No, I wasn't smoking. I'm sorry. Um, but I was still drinking a little and doing little drugs and um, partying on Friday and Saturday night and going to church on Sunday morning and feeling good about myself. And uh, it wasn't until about, well, we moved from Omaha to San Antonio for a while and um, at that time, that was about three years after going to the Contemporary Church is when we started going to a different one in San Antonio. That was, uh, I didn't know anything about denominations or anything like that. The word theology or any of those words confused me, and we just were going to church. And so we tried out at the first church we saw off the interstate when we got into San Antonio, and it happened to be a non-instrumental Church of Christ, and I appreciated the calmer music. <laughs> So, wow. But yeah, <laughs> um, I didn't start reading the Bible though till we moved to Washington State and we tried out a Baptist church, and that's where I started reading my Bible and seeing what Jesus taught and looking around at the people there, knowing what they're involved in and how they're acting and dressing and all of that, and just being confused, not really understanding why they say they're following Jesus, but. They're just really straight up ignoring most of what I saw him say in the New Testament. So that's when I really started digging into things. About four years after I started going to that contemporary church initially. So what kind of church were you going to in Washington? It was a independent fundamental Baptist church. Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so you were at this Baptist church, and you decided, okay, I've been going to church here now for four years or so. Let me decide to open up and actually read the Bible. And, right. And now you're mm -hmm. reading the Bible, and you start reading this for the first time, and you say, wait a second, the people in the church aren't doing what they say in the Bible to do. Right, exactly. And, and really, for me, there were times that I felt like maybe I'm missing something or, or whatever, and I would question them. And they'd give me some roundabout answer on why it doesn't really mean what it seems to say. And um, so really sometimes I doubted whether I was on the right track or not. And, um, you know, these people have been going to church all their lives and they're 60 years old or whatever. And surely they're right and I'm wrong. But I just couldn't shake the feeling that, no, this, I mean, this is what Jesus says, these things that I was seeing. And also further on about the teachings on modesty and everything. So... Um, that just really caused me to question. Now, was it just this church in Washington, or when you reflected back to the other churches you've been? Uh, it was, was it all. Yeah, it was all of them because 
Um, the contemporary church was just a joke to me right from the start because I might as well just be going to a rock concert every Sunday morning. It just, it didn't seem right at all. Um, I did have a little exposure to churches when I was growing up and I'd never seen anything like that before. And I was comfortable there in my tight clothing and, you know, mini skirts and low cut shirts and makeup and jewelry and all of that. And the music was just like what I was listening to while well, I listened to a lot of stuff, but, um, so no, it didn't seem right at all. And then when I opened up the Bible and saw what, what the Bible had to say about not being conformed to the world and um, friendship with the world is enmity with God and uh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I saw all these things and it, it did, it clicked at the time. I just, I realized why I wasn't comfortable there and um, so, why it didn't seem to fit. I mean, I was comfortable in a worldly sense, but not in a, a godly sense. It didn't fit. So when you were going to this church in Washington and you figured this out, what was your mm -hmm. next step? Did you immediately leave the church or did you, did you approach them and ask them? What was your next step? I asked a lot of questions, but just never really got any solid answers. Um, it seemed more like a seemed like they were there almost for the same reason I started at the contemporary church, just because it was the right thing to do everybody let's go to church on Sunday morning and look good, you know. Um, they didn't really have any solid answers. Um, so we, we moved back to the Midwest, and that's what stopped me from going there. But um, we did uh, visit another Baptist church in the Midwest, but that didn't last long. So after that, we just stopped and um, tried to home church. <laughs> okay. So you moved back to the Midwest and you went back to a Baptist church. Uh, how was that experience? Well, it was pretty much the same. I remember very distinctly one time I was, you know how they have the Sunday school lesson or whatever, they split up the families, which I don't agree with that anymore, but um, they split up the families and I was waiting for my children to come back to the, the sanctuary with me and there was this woman sitting in front of me and she reached over, she bent over to pick up a tissue that was on a ledge in front of her. And there really wasn't much left to the imagination with what she was wearing, and it, it just really shocked me. Um, that was a big eye-opener for me and what I was wearing. And um, from that point on, I really was very careful about what I, what I was dressed in. And, um, but we stopped going there for several reasons, but modesty being one of them. So, so this woman, what she did, and, and had she been dressed different than any of the other women in the churches you've seen? For no, moment? no, she was, they were all just, um, um, well, what she was wearing was a, a form-fitting, um, I guess it'd be called like a pencil line skirt. It's just straight down, and um, there's a slit going up the back, and it, it reached the, I think it reached about her ankles. But there was a slit going from her ankles all the way up to about the middle of her thighs. And so then when she bent over, it just went way up. And, of course, it was form-fitting, too. And it was clear that, and, and I know why, I was the same way, just wanting to dress for fashion, wanting to kind of have this image or cloak of modesty. I put little quotes there. <laughs> um, but still want to look cute and pretty and... Um, just not want to stick out too much, just wanting to blend in still. That's that's what was going on. Sure. And that wasn't my heart. I didn't want to do that anymore. So, so when did you decide? So you made your decision then you're going to start dressing a different way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when did, how did you figure out that this was the way to dress? Did you, did you have somebody that, was, uh, that you admired that, or did you just read a book or did you just figure, look, I'm just going to wear clothes that cover my body? Well, um, Actually, the head covering came first. I was still trying to dress cute when I saw the head covering passage in 1 Corinthians 11. And um, that was the first time I had just sat down for a, you know, a couple hours and got out the Strongs and the other books and used the internet and looked up the words that were listed in there and just saw very clearly that um, we're to cover our heads. And so that came first. And the next one that I looked up then, not too long after that, was about the woman's dress. When it speaks of women's clothing and the head covering, they both speak of it being flowing. 
and um, the both the clothing and the covering. And we were visiting a Mennonite church at the time, and this was still in Washington. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> kind of backtracking a little, but we did leave the Baptist church and went visited a Mennonite church for a while. And I saw they had their little caps and and their form fitted cape dresses and everything. And I just couldn't do that either. And I knew that if I became a member of their church that I would have to dress less modest than what I was comfortable with. So um, I don't like to show the size of my waist or I like, you know, I like to cover all of my legs and uh, like to wear a flowing veil and uh, things like that. And that wouldn't have fit into their dress code. So um when we tried out the Baptist church in Omaha, then I just knew I was kind of at a point in my life, that point where I was struggling with conviction and I knew what I needed to do. And I went ahead and just did it. So, um, when, mm -hmm. when you started wearing the head covering, did, did right away people start looking at you different or say what's different with you? Or what are you doing? Well, um, I started wearing a covering when I was still in Washington state and I didn't really know anybody there. And I'll be honest with you. I, I started wearing it. And I, I did not want to wear it, but I saw that that's what the Bible said. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. And so I just put one on and I actually prayed that nobody would come talk to me yet because I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was ready. And I don't know if that sounds silly or not, but um, one thing I noticed right away, though, is um, the way men treated me. Um, before, even with, especially when I was dressing worldly, I mean, I was just an open whatever you'd call that, just open for conversation. Most men just felt totally comfortable approaching me and hitting on me or whatever. But uh, when I started trying to dress more modestly before I put a head covering on, I still got approached by men. I have a tattoo that's visible on my wrist and um, that still seemed to be a real open door for them just to approach me and talk. But then once I put the head covering on, it never happened again. And so it, ha and it hasn't happened ever since I put the head covering on. I get approached no more by men. So, well, when did you go from from not really wanting to wear the head covering, just doing it because you wanted to be obedient, to the idea of now I really enjoy it? When did that happen? <laughs> well, um, that really happened when. See, now Jesus says that if we're going to follow Him, we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Him, and. There were some things still in my life that I was not willing to let go of. And so what happened is um, I finally decided to crucify my flesh and let go of those things. And that's when everything just became new, honestly. Um, my heart changed. I stepped out in faith and really just laid everything down and got all the sin out of my life. And, and then I was just really waiting and expecting, just hoping anybody would come talk to me because I was really excited about sharing. So before it was more an issue of sin in my life, I was being a hypocrite and not really um, totally following the Lord like I knew I should have been. And But once I laid down my life, then um, that's when it all changed. And do you wear a head covering now all the time, some of the time, or how, how, what do you do? I wear a head covering all the time. I believe that um, not only is it, well, you know, the scriptures say pray without ceasing and, and uh, that, but I also believe it's, uh, it's for modesty reasons. The hair is the woman's glory, and I don't want to have a bunch of men looking at my hair. Uh, when I was still in the world, I had very long hair, and it was beautiful, and um, that was another pickup line that men used, and I was, you know, like I said, when my heart was right, I was more than happy to cover up my hair and um, no longer show that to people. Uh, but another reason, you know, it, um, it talks about the headship order, and I believe that's part of that in 1 Corinthians 11. The headship order is always in place, so I believe the head covering should be in place as well. Sure. Well, I, I really think that a hair, and I don't hear many women talk about this, is not only a woman's glory, but it's really her beauty or her sexiness. And women right. today worship their hair. They spend time at the hairdresser or hair dryer and the mm -hmm. hair maker, and, and they just spend so much time with their hair, getting it to look a certain way, because that's like a magnet to attract 
people to look at them and and That's I tell right. I tell people look no matter how tight a woman's clothes are how high her heels are and how her makeup is if she's bald men aren't going to look the same way they would as if she has long beautiful hair and Very true. <laughs> it's, it's a big modesty thing, and I, I'm, I'm glad that women are starting to see this. And, mm-hmm. and, and what a great gift to the husband that you're the only one that could see my sexiness and my beauty, and no one else in the world can. Mm-hmm. It's a great thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. So let's talk about a couple of other things here of, of modesty, because there are women that think they're dressing modest, and then there's modesty. And I've seen some of your pictures, and, and you've created this style of dressing modestly, which is just... You know, you you know when somebody sees you, you're you're there's something biblical about you, and it's just a a, a wonderful thing. Uh, what about? Uh, I want to give you some ideas of modesty that uh, I want to hear your take on, uh, because uh, these are four of the of several of the things that I found the biggest problems for people to let go of in today's world. What about high heels? <laughs> Vanity. Okay. Okay. That's it. I mean, plain and simple. It's vanity. Um, women know why they're putting them on, and it's it's all for show. And it just looks ridiculous. Uh, we go out uh, witnessing on the streets with the brothers sometimes. My daughter and I do, and uh, we'll go out in the nighttime on the in the bar districts and just see these women in these ridiculous shoes, and. They think they're cute, but <laughs> um, they look very foolish, and it's it's just vanity. That's what it is. Okay. What about uh, makeup? Makeup. Well, same makeup is vanity as well. Um, you put makeup on to supposedly make yourself look better, but really what a woman is doing when she does that is she's telling God she doesn't approve of the way he made her. Um, if you look in the Bible, you'll see uh, women like Jezebel wore makeup, and um, all throughout history, um, makeup was for harlots. So, um, for some reason, now nowadays, all of a sudden, it's more widespread practice, but that doesn't change the spirit of it. It's it's for harlots. Now, so. now when you were wearing these things, the makeup and the high heels and the immodest clothing, I know you weren't going out, and women will say, well, I'm not going out thinking, well, I just want to pick up men. They don't purposely do it all the time. Some do and some don't. Uh, but, you know, I always say, the, the effect, you know, your heart doesn't change the effect of your appearance. It still creates an issue. But right. when you say, you know, women are doing it for vanity and women are doing it for attention or whatever reason, do you think there are some women that are just deceived and they have no idea that it's creating this issue and, and they're just doing it for what, a, a different reason? Or do you think every woman that does it knows really what it's doing? I think if um, every woman is honest, deep down in her heart, she will see why she's doing it. But she has to be honest with herself first. So um, that's, uh, <laughs> I can only speak for myself 100%. I knew what I was doing. Um, but I really do think that I, I want to say 100% of women do know what they're doing deep down inside. Um, they know. Sure. Okay. And, and, and the other part of it is one that's not spoken about often, but I see this obsession with women shaving and they want to have a nice smooth sexy leg to show off to the world uh, what's your opinion about the modesty or the heart of modesty and, and and the obsession with shaving for women um well i think that the reason they shave is so they can show off more um, there's no reason to shave if you're not showing off your body um and i'm sure there's some cultures where it wouldn't matter either way but um, I, I believe that that's why women today shave is because they're showing even women that wear um, longer skirts, but they're still showing some of their leg. They they shave because they wouldn't want anybody to see their hairy legs. So um, if you I just think about it, the cost of razors, the time involved doing it, maintaining it, um, that's just vanity. And it's something that we could all do without, in my opinion. Well, Joanne, there's a lot of women who I've interviewed who agree with what you're saying, but they've been brought up this way. You're a woman who was part of the world and dressed like the world and, and came away from it. How difficult 
what is it for somebody to, to, to get free from all that? Does their heart first have to change? Can they do it without their heart being changed? What, what's your opinion? Speak to women out there. And, and, and what's your opinion of all this? Well, I believe that um, that's part of stepping out in faith. Sometimes we may not understand 100% what um, the reasons why the scriptures say what they say, but they're clear. So we just need to step out in faith and do it, even if our, even if sometimes our heart isn't quite in it yet. Um, and and the, the heart will follow, I believe. Now that's, you know, I hope that doesn't sound confusing because I know it can go the other way too, but um, the, spirit, the Spirit is always, you know, God's grace that brings salvation has been given to all men. Um, and it's what's trying to teach us how to live in ways that please the Lord. And it's there if we're willing to listen. Um, so I think uh, if we see what's in the scriptures, dress modestly. Well, I hear ex excuses on the streets a lot. Oh, well, God hasn't convicted me of that yet. Well, it's there plain and simple that we're to dress modestly and cover our heads. Um, God's not waiting to just magically convict you about it. He's waiting for you to step out in faith and obey. So... Um, that, that's what I believe. I believe that God has given us what we need. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit, his grace, and we have no excuse. We just need to step out and do it. Wow. Well, Joanne, as, I, as I'm hearing what you're saying and agree with everything you're saying, uh, I know there's going to be women that are going to be upset when they hear your message saying things like, you know, how dare her tell me what to do or how to do it, and, and you're just letting people know what the scriptures say and, and right. people need to realize that and 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 correct me if i'm wrong you're not saying somebody's saved or not saved if they wear a head covering you're talking about their heart am i correct mm -hmm. yes i am um talking about the heart it is definitely a heart issue and i i do believe that um it's it's evolution of sorts um some people just see everything clear as day right away and they just make all these changes, and, and that's what's in their heart to do, and they go for it, and they're consistent, and they keep going. And other people, they can only handle little changes at a time, uh, but we must be honest with ourselves and not make excuses for why we haven't changed. So if you know something is good and clear, and it's right there in the scriptures, and you don't do it, you're sinning. Um, you know, but some people just simply like when I first started reading the Bible, there were things that I saw right away, and then there were other things as I kept reading through it, through it, through it, again and again and again. Because um, we started reading the Bible together as a family when I first started reading the New Testament, and I heard that if you read seven chapters a day, you can get through it in about 45 days or something. So we just kept doing that over and over and over again, and um, saw so many things each time um, that we missed the time before. So it, it also just might be a, a, a matter of uh, lack of being in, in the scriptures and reading what the Lord has to say to us. Uh, so. some, something that's very powerful, Joanne, is, is whenever I see a woman, uh, a young girl that's immodest today, I just mm -hmm. think, I wonder how their parents are dressed. And then you see the mother and you say, oh, well, it's no wonder why the kid's yeah. so immodest. And, right. and, and, and it it's a, makes a big sense, a big message to your children uh, the mm -hmm. way you dress, and it's not a hundred percent. Sometimes they rebellious, and even if you're modest. But uh, uh, in another interview, I'm going to interview your daughter. But uh, if your daughter's nearby now, if she could step in a, a camera view uh, real quickly, I just want to give people an example of the message you send parents with uh, your children. Look at this. The message there is, uh, and uh, what's your daughter's name? What's your name? Brianna Exted. Uh, Brianna, we're going to interview you in another interview, but uh, I I just want to uh, how. How powerful was it that your mom did these things and on for out of her appearance uh, to send that message to you more than her just telling you to do something but doing it? Well, it definitely made an impact on me. I can't say I'd be here if she wasn't a good example for me. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, we're looking forward to get you in an interview as well. I just wanted people to see the what what the message sends to women out there that have young women, girls and uh thank you so much and uh okay so we're gonna uh continue here with closing <laughs> up this interview here uh if if there are any women out there that are struggling with this 
and I, I want people to put your comments and questions below the video but uh, how could they get in touch with you if they if they'd like to? do you have a blog or a website um, I have a blog it's called few there be that find it dot blogspot dot com um, just just like what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 about straight is the gate and narrow is the way and few there be that find it and uh, email address is my first and last name, J-O-A-N-N-E-S-M-I-T-H-6819 at gmail.com. Wonderful. So what, is your, what, what would your opinion be to some women that uh, desire to wear a head covering, but their husbands uh, don't want them to? What would your opinion be about that? Well, um, or, or vice versa. They want to wear it, and they're, or they don't want to wear it, but their husbands want them to, one way or the other. What would your feedback be? Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I run into, uh, more commonly, women who are already wearing a covering against their husband's wishes. Um, it causes contention and division in their family. Um, and I just uh, counsel them and encourage them that uh, 1 Corinthians 11, the very first thing it talks about is the headship order. And it's clear that the husband is the head of the wife. Um, and, and in 1 Peter 3, uh, I think it's verses 1 through 6, and we are encouraged to uh, submit to our husbands who don't obey the word. Um, and so, and Sarah is given as an example in that passage. Um, so if, if we have a meek and quiet spirit, uh, if a woman really does want to cover and her husband doesn't want her to, um, she's not supposed to preach to him or try to teach him. She can pray about it, take it to the Lord, and um, the Lord knows her heart. He knows that she sincerely desires to want to cover, but her husband, her head, won't let her, and he will have to answer on Judgment Day for that um, if he doesn't change his thoughts there. But um, she, her job, her place is to submit to him, and the Lord knows her heart, so she just needs to be meek and quiet and submissive. Um, and not try to be preachy or teachy or um, pouty or nagging or anything like that. Um, and then I, I also know some women who are glad their husbands don't want them to cover because they don't want to cover anyway. <laughs> so um, that obviously is the wrong heart, and um, she'll have to stand up in judgment for that someday as well. So it it's really comes back to an issue of the heart. If you want to cover and your husband doesn't want you to, you need to obey him. The Lord knows your heart. Now, now, um, now not only the head covering, but from what you're saying, and I want to make it clear so everyone understands it, it, your opinion on this. If what if it, the whole topic of dressing modestly, if a woman wants to dress modestly and the husband doesn't want her to, are mm -hmm. you suggesting that the woman should uh, please her husband more than dressing modestly? Yes, um, in, in a simple short answer, yes. Uh, like I said, if that's really her heart to dress modestly in a way that pleases the Lord and her husband doesn't want her to, he's going to have to answer for that. And I've, I've had testimonies. I do some ministering to women online um, just through email and sometimes over the phone. Um, women who truly have a heart to submit to their husbands, um, if they act in a way that the Lord wants them to act, their husbands usually come along sooner or later. So it's just a matter of being patient and um, loving their husbands and, and um, all of that. And if he wants her to dress in a way that she's not comfortable with, her whole countenance is going to scream that. And, and I think sooner or later he'll just see that and, and be ashamed. But um, I don't really know how to explain that all. <laughs> well, no, that is um, powerful. And I could see how it can... Uh, people can take that the wrong way, but that's excellent right. advice. That's wonderful mm -hmm. advice because the, it's it's a, it's a human nature attitude of to become rebellious in that situation, uh, right. and, and and women start talking about oppression and so on, mm -hmm. where that that is just uh, that's just really something that you don't hear women say often because you're not just saying uh, if a woman uh, uh, listens to her husband and, and and goes against what she feels is the right way you're saying this will ultimately usually lead to the husband yes. softening up and saying, okay. Well, that's what the scripture says in First Peter 3, that she can win him without a word, but just by her way of living alone. Um, the Bible I read says her chaste conversation 
which would be her, her way of living, um, she can win him to the truth without saying a word, just by the way she acts. So if she's acting in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, um, she's clear before the Lord. Uh, and, and he's going to have to stand stand before the Lord for that one way or the other someday. But um, it's just, it's a good testimony for her just to be submissive. And, and I know when I say this to some women, you know, they come up with all sorts of what if situations and what if scenarios. And I just say, you know, let's just, what's real? You know, because we can, we can concoct all sorts of imaginary situations where they would just be terrible things if a man ever asked you to do this, that, or the other. But I have heard some terrible stories of, of what um, husbands have asked their wives to do. And um, it's just a beautiful testimony of what happens when the woman is in her place. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful. Are you suggesting at all a woman submit in every single uh, situation under any circumstance or are you saying uh, are you saying that there's you are you just talking about the issue of modesty well um, I can say in general I'm saying every circumstance um, but I believe that the Lord if you really do love the Lord now this is this is the key if a woman really loves the Lord he will not put her in a situation that she can't get out of in a way that pleases him so um, what she needs to do if she's in a difficult situation is just take it to the Lord and really consider what her next, next steps are because some women really are in dangerous situations and difficult situations. And, um, and so we want to be sensitive to that. But most women honestly are not. Most, most women um, just want to do their own thing and they don't want to submit to their husbands. So in general, we're dealing with most women who, who really do have rebellious hearts. There are a few who are in dangerous situations who, who do not have rebellious hearts, who really just want to do what pleases the Lord. And, and the results are always good. And what about a situation on the reverse of that, where a husband would want the, the woman to uh, dress more modestly or, or wear head coverings or, or not wear pants and, and, and issues like this, and a woman is not ready to make that change yet? Uh, do you say the same thing? The woman should still submit? Um, well, here again, it, uh, that's kind of a, that's a big question. Um, I always believe the woman should submit, but <laughs> the head covering, the point of the head covering is to show submission. And uh, one of the points is for submission. And if you're not really submitted in your heart, then I believe you shouldn't. Like if my daughter were to start rebelling right now, I would tell her to take her covering off because she's having a false representation of, of what is pleasing to the Lord. It goes back to the heart. It really does. Because um, I'll give you an example. There are some things in Scripture at the beginning that I saw that were just like, ouch. You know, the Lord expects that of me. And, um, but my heart was to follow the Lord and please the Lord. And so I submitted, even though I didn't understand or it was difficult or I didn't really want to, but I just knew this is what the Lord wants me to do. And I'm committed to following the Lord and submitting to him. And in the same way, the wife should have that same heart towards her husband. Um, if her husband wants her to cover, she may not understand she may not want to, it may be uncomfortable for her, but because she loves her husband and respects him and, and um, sees him as her head, she should obey him, yes. So what faith are you now? What, what actually, uh, what kind of congregation are you going to now? Um, we're just a group of people that do all we know how to follow the Lord. That's just, try to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, we're very into going out on the streets, um, Several times a week, the men will go, and I try to go whenever I can uh, and speak to, I try to go and speak to the women that are there, but um, they get pretty hostile sometimes. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to follow the Lord the best we know how, and uh, it's a nice, uh, beautiful group of people. That is so wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time, Joanne, to come uh, speak to us today. And I want to encourage everyone to get to your blog. And is there anything you want to say before we end? Um, I guess I wouldn't mind touching a little on judging, if that's okay. 
Absolutely. Uh, tell us. Um, tell us about that. Well, I, like I said, I do a lot with women on the streets, whether it be in a downtown district on a Friday or Saturday night or at a college campus. And I don't bring up modesty. It's just not something that I do. I'll, I'll just bring up, you know, just what do you know about Jesus? What does he teach? And why aren't you following that? And, you know, stuff like that. But inevitably, a lot of them will just, do you think I'm going to hell because I'm not dressed modest? And it's just, that's that's what I mean by how, it's, it's in our hearts to dress in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. Um, but what helps bring it out is when, when you see other women doing it. And it just, for a lot of women, it brings convi- conviction instantly. And I don't have to say a word about it. They just right away assume that I'm condemning them for the way they're dressing. But I'm just standing there dressed modestly, and that's what condemns them. So... Um, I think that's just interesting to note that women do see it, and a lot of women have the reaction that I'm oppressed, or I'm just brainwashed, my husband told me to dress this way, or I'm doing this because my church tells me, and um, it's just simply not true. I, I started all of this on my own, and just by reading the scriptures. So um, but that's a common a common thought, is that I do this because somebody else has told me I need to do it or is forcing me to do it, and I'm so oppressed. <laughs> but uh, I'm free, and it's a blessing. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It's in the scriptures that say uh, the actions are revealed by the heart, and you have uh, the most righteous heart, and it is just a great thing to see. And I thank you for setting the example for other women out there. And, of course, uh, people, don't, people don't like to hear or, or, or you know, it, it's difficult to hear the truth, but... But, you know, and I always say, without you having to say a word, even opening your mouth once, or anyone out right. there, just by the way we look should be a testimonial. And, uh, That's it's, right. It's a great thing. And uh, I, I, I'm, my story is similar to yours, where I completely changed the way mm-hmm. I, I used to dress and, and look and so on. And and some people don't even recognize me anymore. And not only by the way I look, but by the way I act. And that's a compliment That's-, to me. Because- that's a blessing. <laughs> It sure is. I don't want to be that person I once was, and it's a That's it's right. a great thing. So, Amen, sister. Thank you so much for joining Thanks. us, and uh, and please come back on the show again, and we'll get this video out. And sure. and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Paul. God bless. Come out of the world, oh my people, seek the truth, avoid the evil, learn Yahweh's ways, Torah life ministries, come out of the world. Oh.